In Jeremiah chapter 10, reading verse 1 and 2, we read this passage last week in our sermon, but we didn't begin with it. But I want to read verse 1 and 2 to begin this morning, and then we're going to turn away from here in a little bit. Last Sunday night, I preached a message on idolatry. We wrote an article in October 2004 on idolatry. I think we used the same outline. Tonight, we're going to be preaching a message on occultism, or I'm going to title it, Occult Practices. And we wrote an article in 2002 in April and preached a message on it uh, also back then. Now, notice with me as we come here and reading these two verses, and uh, some of the articles, by the way, some other articles would be, um, I've got them laying here, I will not get to use these, probably. Uh, always, uh, I told uh, someone a while ago, uh, it's a hard sermon for me tonight to try to get everything in, but uh, some other articles we have would be on yoga, we find occultism in that, video games, one on the Olympics superheroes, martial arts, Disney, Fantasia. There's a few others, but I can't remember what they are right now. Notice he says, Jeremiah writing, and he says, Hear the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Father, we thank Thee this evening for this complete day that You've given us this morning and tonight. And Lord, we thank You for the privilege again to be able to come together and worship together. And Lord, we pray for Thy leading. We pray for Thy guidance from Thy Word and Thy Spirit. And Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen, and you may be seated. The Bible in both Old and New Testament has a lot to say about idolatry, as we seen last week, and it also has a lot to say about occult practices which are forbidden and are an abomination to God, and God's people are to reject them. Now, there's only two sources of spiritual power, as I mentioned also last week. It's either from God or Satan, and of course, Satan's power is limited. And one day, he will be in the lake of fire without any power. Amen. Satan said in Genesis 3, 5 to Eve, said, uh, and Adam said, You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And as we read from there through the Scriptures, we know that he has a certain amount of power and influence. We also know that, uh, that God has all power. We see this throughout the Holy Scriptures. To seek anything apart from God is idolatry. It's through the Lord that we have eternal life. Peter said that in John chapter 6 and verse 68. Now, this evening, I want to speak on the occult, not cult, C-U-L-T. We've done several sermons on cults. There's a difference between the occult and an occult, the O-C-C-U-L-T. If we just talk about cults, all the, what that is is a religious group or movement that departs from Orthodox Christianity, which is the recognized norm. And I'll give you a few that has departed. In other words, they did start denying the, uh, the divinity of Christ or adding to the Scriptures. And you could include Freemasonry, Moonies, uh, Unification Church, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists. We could call them cults. But tonight we're talking about the occult. And I'm going to give you a definition. Occult is a blanket term covering a wide variety of many practices. And I'll give you just a few of those and give you some definitions. But the occult means something secret or hidden and can be defined as this, and I'm quoting from another author, 
can be defined as beyond the bounds of ordinary knowledge, mysteries, or hidden view. And the word occult comes from the Latin occultus, which means concealed. And I want to go through just a few terms in, in the Scripture. But here's some that you can include in this, and I'm going to open this up and give you a few definitions before we start into our sermon. But some of the things you could include in what we would call the occult, again, it's a blanket term that covers many things. Some of these that we'll mention tonight, witchcraft, astrology, psychics, palm reading, fortune telling, divinations, horoscopes, crystal gazing, voodoo, magic, spiritism, Satanism, dreams, tarot cards, Ouija boards, numerology, yoga, spells, reincarnation, hypnosis, Halloween, seances, all of these would be under the title of occult, channeling, magicians, charmers, familiar spirits, I'm going to throw Mardi Gras in there, as well because it's filled with occult uh, practices and body modifications. And you could add another 50 or 100 to this. Those are just a few that I thought of to write down as I was preparing this. Now, we'll, we'll give a definition for witchcraft in just a few moments. But let me just give you a definition of a few words that we're going to run across tonight. A witch, you can write down Exodus 22:18. That's a female who, one who knows, one who practices witchcraft, a worshiper of Satan. A wizard, Leviticus 19:31. A male, one who practices witchcraft as a witch would practice it. Now, if you don't want to write all these down right now, I, these are in the article. So I'm just reading through part of that, and then we'll get on to something else in just a moment. A charmer, Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. Someone who is involved in sorcery and probably involved in casting spells. Divination or a diviner. Divination, Deuteronomy 18, we'll read there in a little bit, verses 10 through 14. Fortune telling, telling the future, divining into the unknown, mentioned again in a multitude of places and numbers in 1 Samuel 6 2 and other places. You find the expression familiar spirits. King Saul went to a familiar spirit, and that brought him to his end of his life. And familiar spirits, uh, they're devils, they're spirits, they're deceiving spirits. The word enchantment is used, Leviticus 19.26, that is communicating with evil spirits, charmers, or spell casting. Necromancing is Deuteronomy 18.11. We'll read that in a few moments. The art of communicating or pretending to communicate with the dead, channeling. In other words, you'll find this in Leviticus and Samuel and Isaiah and many other places. God mentions these things a multiple multiple times. So this is why we need to remind ourselves of these. The word sorcery is used in Old and New Testament. And I'll give more of a definition for that in witchcraft a little bit later. But uh, the word sorcery, Acts 8, verse 9 and 11, the practice of witchcraft, divination, enchanting, magic, and again, Revelation 9 and Revelation 18 and other places in the New Testament. Soothsayers, Acts 16:16, 16, 16, one who divines, uh, has to do with fortune telling. We see it in Joshua and Isaiah as well. Magi- magicians, I mentioned this last Sunday night in the subject of idolatry, and we may turn back to one of those passages. Exodus 7, write this down in case we don't make it there, verses uh, 10 through 12. Uh, a magicians, they are diviners. The use of magic, one who works miracles by the power of Satan. Now, they might not tell you they're working this power by Satan. And you'll find magicians and astrologers that are mentioned in Daniel 1.20, Daniel 2, verse 1 and 2, and verse 10, and Daniel chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, 
and also with Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, you'll find it in chapter 5. I believe it's going to be around verses 7 through 11. Now notice here, as we come back, let's read these two verses. And I'm going to lay this aside now. And i got some other quotes here. Some of these I did quote here a week or so ago, and some of them I did not. But notice as we come back to this passage here, he says, he says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. House of Israel was God's ancient people of the Old Testament. We today, the church, and I'm talking about throughout the whole world, we're referred to in Galatians 6 as the Israel of God. So, God is speaking to us as well through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Then He said this, and this whole chapter, I'm only going to read these two verses, this whole chapter is dealing with God and the idols that oppose God. The whole chapter. Speaking of graven images, molten images. And uh, he begins in verse 3 talking about the customs of the people that are vain. But he said in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord. Now this is what God says to all of us. Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. The heathen are those who are lost, involved in pagan practices. I tell people that one time I was a heathen and a pagan. I was lost. Then I got saved. I, I, I don't mind using those terms. I mean, I didn't. I, I wasn't following God. Now I wasn't involved in astrology and things. I've always thought that was kind of silly. But uh, we're, we're going to talk about astrology here in just a moment. We're going to turn to Isaiah before we go to Daniel. But we find here that the heathen are mentioned, and he says to the Christian, to the believer, to the house of Israel here, learn not the way of the heathen. That is the Gentile nations. And America now is a Gentile nation. And he said, be not dismayed, at the signs of heaven. Astrology is an ancient heathen practice. As we see, if we look at history or look in the Bible, this is so. Now turn with me to the book of Isaiah in chapter 47 before we head to Deuteronomy. I almost was going to skip this chapter, but we need to read it. The chapter is dealing with judgment upon Babylon. So let me read just um, let me read two verses because there's a, some words that are used here. In verse 12, he says, "Stand now with thine enchantments." There's a word I mentioned a moment ago, and he said, "And with the multitude of thy sorceries." We mentioned that word, and he says, "Wherein thou hast labored from thy youth, if so be thou shalt be able to profit." If so be thou mayest prevail. Now he said in verse 13, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Babylon was getting, and Israel too many times was getting the wrong counsels. And he said, he said, now let the astrologers, we find the subject of astrology in the Bible, not astronomy. He's not talking about here astronomy. Astronomy is, a, is science an objective study of the heavens or the earth or anything else. But astrology is a form of divination. And he says here, he said, let, let now the astrologers, and, and the Lord is using a little sarcasm in these two verses with Babylon. He said, let now the astrologers and the stargazers now, this doesn't mean we can't enjoy looking at the stars, but he's talking about, and, and notice the monthly prognosticators, horoscopes, and things of that nature. I'm in chapter uh, 47. Chapter 47. Did I not give that? Okay. And then he says, Stand up and save, save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. 
So we have, verse 12, enchantments and sorceries. And verse 13, we have astrologers, stargazers, and monthly prognosticators. And I I want you, if you have any uh, interest in astrology, I want you to go and listen to my sermon on astrology 12 years ago. And I went back to Genesis and many places. We went back to Genesis and talked about what the sun and the moon and the stars were created for. And uh, they're for seasons and days and months and years. They're not to predict your future. And we find that astrology is an ancient heathen practice. And we find that astrology is centered around getting our directions from the heavenly bodies. And I go into a lot of details. And I even, I even go into the aspect of uh, dealing uh, with the sign of the zodiac. There are those Christians. I had two books in my office that I threw away many, many years ago. And one was titled The Gospel and the Stars. And, and, uh, and, and basically, uh, when Christians start talking about the zodiac and you have the history of man and the gospel and all those things, all it is, is when we talk about the signs of the zodiac, we're talking about a Christianized version of astrology. It's wrong. It's wicked and it is of the devil. And, uh, and I could show you a picture here, and I call this the vain imaginations of man, Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. And if you take all the little lines that man has drawn to the stars, you don't have this. Man has made this up. This is the imaginations of man when you get to talking about these things. Now, astrology, even according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, it says it is an ancient art or science of divining the fate and future of human beings from uh, indications given by the positions of the stars and other heavenly bodies. And that's volume 2, page 575, 19 and 56. Astrology is a belief system that the stars play a role in our birth, our life, and our destiny, and that is a lie. There is true science and there's false science. How do we know that? 1 Timothy 6, verse 20 and 21 says, It speaks of avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred from concerning the faith. So science falsely so called like astrology has called people, caused people to leave the faith and embrace this wickedness. Turn with me to Deuteronomy and notice with me in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Now notice here as we come to this fact, this passage to me sums it up better than probably anything. Now, a few, a few, uh, when we preached on uh, idolatry, spoke on idolatry, and I think another subject I made mention of this, but let me just uh, remind you of some things when we talk about astrology and witchcraft and the occult. We find that many movies introduce people to the occult. And I mentioned Disney. And I mentioned Disney, the magic kingdom, not the kingdom of God. And I mentioned you, uh, Disney, we, we've we got a, a booklet on that, and Fantasia, we've got a sermon and a booklet on that, a transcript. And Fantasia, I'm going to carry you back again and make this statement. Uh, it's over, uh, it's about 82 years ago, it was produced in 1940. And I just want to show you, the occult, when I said earlier that the cult is found in, in books and music and just everywhere you turn, you can find the occult uh, in our society. 
But this one movie, Fantasia, the centerpiece of this movie is The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Do I need to go any farther? 82 years ago, and it's made for children, and it's an animated film, and it has wicked classical music put to it. And we find that uh, uh, it has the centerpiece of Fantasia's The Sorcerer's Apprentice with Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. And the final segment is Chinnabog, the, the embodiment of Satan. It has, there's five segments, there's eight total. Five segments are based on pagan mythology. And one segment is based on the, the whole segment is based on the theory of evolution. So this film, now listen to me tonight, this film, 82 years old, people say Disney has changed. No, Disney has always been wicked. It's always been wicked. And it presents the occult, witchcraft, sorcery, Satanism, this one movie. It presents evil as good and denies God as creator. It presents nudity, nudity, sexual connotations, drunkenness, occult themes, pagan deities, again, mythology and evolution. And this was done in 1940. What about the movie... Uh, and you say, well, you're really going away back there. If you can go back there and prove that Hollywood is wicked, why do we have to research things now? What about The Wizard of Oz? How many's ever seen that? I've seen it years ago. And that was produced August the 12th, 1939. Now, what do you think about The Wizard of Oz and the cult? The good witches and the bad witches. There is no such thing as a good witch. And I mentioned to you last week, I mentioned you in 1965 in, in, the, these, in sitcoms back then, I guess it's called a sitcom then, I Dream of Jeannie. And then in 1964, Bewitched. And uh, it's supposed to be nice witches and genies and harmless, and they were entertaining. You know what they did? They introduced us to the occult. I watched them. I watched them years ago and, uh, and thought they were funny at the time. You know, and they were entertaining. Find out later, you've got witchcraft, and I dream of genie. You've got a lot of nudity and nudity in that one, as well. And even Time magazine said in 1994, Lion King is the most dirty, perverse, and violent movie that Disney has ever put out. And I'm just saying. Uh, that that the occult is everywhere you turn. It's in music. It's even in arts. And it's places we've got to be very careful with it. If I have the time, I'm going to deal with the Olympics. I'm going to deal with yoga. We have sermons. Uh, I'm going to deal with the superheroes, video games, and so forth. We, uh, we find the occult in all of these things. But I'm going to say one other thing before I read here. And uh, uh, Harry Potter. How many remember the, those series that came out? Bestseller of books and movies both, and it presented good wizards and witches as well as evil wizards and witches. There is no such thing as a good wizard or witch. And let me come back to C.S. Lewis and Disney. Disney in 2005 released a new movie entitled The Chronicles of Narnia based on C.S. Lewis' book entitled The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is also found in Christian bookstores. And I'm absolutely amazed when I hear a Christian quote from C.S. Lewis. I did, I did a sermon a number of years ago on that, and I, there's been thousands of people that's listened to that around the world. Some got mad and some got glad. And some, you know, realize that it's bad. But let me just give you a quote uh, about C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis had a fascination with mythology and a cult even after he was supposedly converted. I wonder whether he was ever converted or not. And here's his own words. Uh, he grew up reading occult books, and even after his conversion, he said this. He, uh, he said, I still read with delight, speaking of occult books. And he also said, the center story of my life is all about nothing else. In other words, occult books. He was involved in fantasy, occult, myths, 
legends and the unknown. We don't need that as Christians. All it's going to do is rob us of our spirituality. And it's going to take our minds and hearts away from God. I'm telling you, we've got to stay in the Word. We've got to believe the Word. We've got to be like David, as I preached on this morning. David's heart uh, was a following God, and he never got sidetracked back there. And that's why they won a victory. We need to win victories in our lives, in our families, in our church today. And we need victories. Now, notice in Leviticus, I'm going to read from verses 9 through 15. And uh, this chapter is divided up in really about four ways. Verses 1 through 9 is dealing with the Levitical priesthood. In verses 9 through uh, uh, 14, I should say 14, it's dealing with the occult. And then in verses 15 through 19, it's dealing with Christ. And then in verses 20 through uh, 22, it's dealing with false prophets. Do you know when you come to verse 15 through 22, uh, we've got a choice in this chapter. We can either believe in the occult or we can believe in Christ. Moses said in verse 15, he said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet uh, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, and him ye shall hear. He's speaking of Christ, and that's written down uh, in the book of Acts in chapter 13. But notice in verse 18, let me read this before I come back to verse uh, 9. Notice what we mean in verse uh, 18. And, and by the way, that's not Acts 13, it's Acts 3. I gave you a moment ago, Acts 3, where this is uh, referred to. But notice he said in verse 18, I'll raise up a, a, a prophet from among their brethren, like unto them, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And in verse 19, it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto the words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And in this chapter, we have a choice. He mentions the first part of the Levites and their ministry. Then he mentions the last part of the chapter, false prophets. But in between, he mentions the occult compared to the truth and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's read this and and make note of it. Notice uh, as we begin in verse 9, this is the second law that God gave. They're ready to go into the promised land. And so what He does, He reminds the people to be different from the nations that they're going in to possess their land. And uh, we've seen a battle this morning with David and Goliath. And, you know, the Israelites and the Philistines. And, uh, and so as Israel is getting ready to go into the promised land, God gives them the law the second time as, as a reminder. Now notice what he says as we read from verse, uh, nine. He says in verse nine, and when thou art come into the land, see David was fighting for that land this morning we we're reading. When thou come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn, here we are with this again, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of the nations. The word abomination basically means something that God hates. And, uh, and as my wife and I were talking about abominations the other day, once an abomination, always an abomination. Abominations don't change. If God says in the Old Testament it's an abomination, you're going to find in the New Testament it's an abomination. Idolatry is an abomination in both Testaments. Sodomy is an abomination in both Testaments. There's several things that are abomination, things that God hates. And so he, there, what we're going to find here, there's nine occult practices that are listed here. And there's others all through the Scripture, Old and New Testament. Notice in verse 10, we find, uh, we even find child sacrifice here, uh, associated with occult practices. So think about abortions today. It's associated with occult practices. He said in verse 10, there shall not be found among you any that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire. They sacrificed children in the Old Testament. The pagans did. And he said, or uses divinations. I'll give you a definition of some of these now. It's the occult. 
or an observer of times. Look out into space. I've seen people look out in space and say, I wonder if there's any anybody, uh, any intelligence out there. And sometimes I wonder if there's any intelligence here on earth. And he says, he says, or enchanters or a witch. A witch wasn't even to be allowed to stay in the land of Israel. They either had to leave or die. A wizard or a witch. And then he said in verse 11, or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits, that is, demonic spirits, or a wizard or a necromancer, those who are trying or pretending or communicating with the dead. And then he said and again, he said, and all these, and all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God shall drive them out from thee. So why did Israel get the land of Canaan? God drove out those that were committing abominations. Now, Israel ended up doing the same thing and lost the land at different times. He said in verse 13 and 14, He said, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. And He said in verse, uh, notice in verse 14, in uh, verse 14, He says, For these nations which thou shalt possess... Hearkened unto observers of times. They look into the heavens and they were trying to predict their future and their destiny. And he said, And unto diviners, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered, that word means allowed, thee to do so. And then he mentions a prophecy of Jesus Christ in verse 16 through 18. So clearly, we see that the occult is mentioned in the Bible and it is an abomination. And I want you to turn back to verse 10 and look at the last verse in verse 10. He mentions a witch. And then notice uh, in verse 11 the word wizard. So what is witchcraft? Well, it's the use of satanic power for information or influence. But again, wizards and witches were often regarded by the pagans as benefactors of society. But as far as God was concerned, they were not allowed to live in the land. They either left or, or they died. One writer says that witchcraft and spiritism often involve the ritual ritualistic use, rather, of the magic potions and mind-controlling drugs. In other words, it, 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 witchcraft involves both divinations and idolatry. You can tie those two things together. It involves the use of magic, skills, and abilities. So we have here in verse 10, 11, uh, not only these other words that are mentioned here, but we have wizards and witches. And again, I mentioned to you Leviticus 19.31, and um, you write down Second Chronicles 33 and verse uh, 6, Manassas used witchcraft and dealt with familiar spirits, that is, devils. The King James doesn't use, we use the word devil sometimes, King James uses devils. So when you see the word devils, that's what most people refer to as demons. And, uh, and so uh, he, Manassas as a king got in a lot of trouble and God had put him in fetters and, and put him in a place where he had to repent, and he did repent. Did you know that Wicca in our country is a form of witchcraft? That for many years uh, it is treated as a religion in America, and it's a 5013C status? That's Wicca in our country in America. I don't even, I don't even like fortune cookies. I mean, I, I, I want to stay away from any of this kind of stuff. Now, if they would put in a fortune cookie, repent or perish, get right or get lost, uh, I would say, okay, that's fine. <laughs> now, in other words, repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That would be fine. Notice, notice in Exodus, we read this uh, passage last week. I want to read it again just to tie it in from idolatry into uh, witchcraft. Notice in Exodus chapter 7, and, uh, and the Apostle Paul also makes reference to some of this in the New Testament. 
But notice with me as we come to Exodus chapter 7. I'm going to give you a quote too by another author in witchcraft. The New Testament Greek word pharmakia is translated in English as witchcraft and sorcery. And it's from uh, uh, which we get our word pharmacy. And so there is evidently a connection between the occult and mind-altering drugs. I'm not talking about if you need an aspirin or take something or pain, but there's evidently a connection between the occult and mind-altering drugs which open people up to the occult world. And there are drugs that will do that. Now notice as we read here in, in this passage, and again, there's just so many places. I mentioned to you in Daniel 1, Daniel 2, Daniel 4, Daniel 5 a moment ago, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he brought his magicians and his astrologers and his Chaldeans in when he needed answers for something. He made dreams something. God gave him a dream. And, and of course, you know, Daniel had to finally come. And, and tell the dream, and Belshazzar did the same thing. He called the same group in that his father or grandfather did, and uh, he died because of this as well. Now, Nebuchadnezzar finally was converted. So there's magicians and astrologers that are mentioned all through the Scripture. Now, notice as we come here to Exodus 7, and if you're taking notes, write down 2 Kings 23-24, under King Josiah, we call it Josiah's reform, he cleaned house and brought reform to the nation of Israel. And he had to deal with witchcraft and idolatry. That's one of the two major things that he had to deal with. Now write this down in Nahum, that's a minor prophet, Nahum 3, verses 4 through 7, Nineveh. Now we find a nice story of Nineveh in the book of Jonah, don't we? We find them repenting. I mean, they repented their sins and God spared them. But when we read Nahum, Nineveh, after they repented under Jonah's preaching, about 150 years later, Nahum prophesied of their destruction. Why? Because of witchcraft and idolatry. 150 years later, they went down. Now notice as we come here to this passage... Now, we're going to find here sorcerers, and, and, and I, could, I could give you the others if you wanted them. I think some of those are in the, uh, in the article I have here. But uh, you'll find them, these magicians, again, you'll find them later in this chapter. You'll find them in chapter 8. Uh, you'll find them in chapter 9. But I, I want to read, as we read last week, I want to read verses 11 through 12. You see, the reason I'm serious about this there's not, we're not to play around with this stuff. Amen. We're not to play around with it. And if anybody has it in their life, they need to get rid of it. Yeah. Amen. I'm, I'm going to be reading from verse 11, then we're going to turn to the New Testament. Now he says here, well let me back up to verse 10. Verse 10, And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did, did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Now, this is the power of God. God told Moses and Aaron to go in and to perform some miracles before Pharaoh. And this is one of them. But notice what Pharaoh did. And he did this several times. But he got to the place where the magicians couldn't do it. And he said in verse 11, And then Pharaoh also called the wise men. And the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner, they imitated Moses and Aaron, they did in like manner with their enchantments. See, we've seen that word. And then he said in verse 12, For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. Never underestimate the power of Satan. His power is limited, but he has power, and he'll suck people in to the occult and into idolatry. He'll rob them of the Scripture, yes, amen. and he'll rob them of salvation. Yeah. But, he go, now, but it goes on, it says, but Aaron's rods swallowed up their rods. Of course, all this did is hardened 
Pharaoh's heart as you step into the next verse. The Apostle Paul mentions these when he's describing the last days. In 2 Timothy 3.8, he said, Janies and Jamberies withstood Moses. And they must have been chief magicians in that particular day. Now go to Galatians 5. Go to Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read here in the book of Revelation, probably close. And I want to, I want to give you some other verses that may not be in the article. But notice as we come here to Galatians chapter 5, Ephesians 5.11 tells us to stay away from the works of darkness. Acts 13, verse 30 and 31, and if you take the whole context, I mentioned this last week, idolatry and witchcraft must be repented of. Uh, I believe that TV today, as I said earlier, introduces people to witchcraft and idolatry. Here's some verses I want to give you. I, I, I can't remember. I don't think they're in the article. But in Acts 7, verse 41 through 43, we know that Israel ended up in idolatry and witchcraft many times and God had to chasten them. But they worshipped the host of heaven, the stars and the moon and the sun. They They did just what God told them not to do and God had to deal with them. In Acts chapter 8, see this is not just an Old Testament thing. In Acts 8 and verse 9 through 13, Simon the sorcerer, in other words, the cult leads to demonic possession. In Acts 13, verses 6 through 12, Elymas, the sorceress, a child of the devil, got caught up in this. In Acts 16, verse 16 through 20, at the city of Philippi, when Paul, was it Paul and Silas that went there? Somebody help me. I believe it's Paul and Silas. They got put in jail over, over this. My wife said yes. Okay, a woman possessed with a spirit of divination, she's, uh, uh, that is a soothsayer, opposed Paul and Silas. And one other I'm going to give you in Acts chapter 19, verses 18 through 20. At, at Ephesus, Paul went there preaching, established a church. And um, you know what some of the people started doing as he's preaching the Word of God? They cleaned house. They burned their books. A lot of books need to be burned today. A lot of CDs need to be burned today. A lot of DVDs need to be burned today. And I could step farther than that, I guess, into MP3s and MP4s and all of that. I can easily date myself. I'm not careful. But you know what it was called there in Acts 19? Uh, I'd read the whole chapter because uh, verse 13 through 20 also deals with this, verse 23 through 29 and 35. You have the temple there of the goddess Diana. And Paul, boy, when he came through preaching, he messed their business up. People getting saved, you know, it's called, you know what they did? They burned their books. It was called Curious Arts. In other words, it was the arts of divination, it was magical arts. I bet they burn all their comic books and all their CDs and their books and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know they had comic books back then, but anyway, they burned everything that had anything to do with the occult. In other words, that's radical conversion. In other words, when we, when we truly get saved and God moves with inside of us by His Holy Spirit, it, and, and it takes time, there's a process, but you, we start dealing with the things in our life. When we find something wrong, we deal with it. And I'm still doing that, and I'm going on 70. I find something in the Scripture and say, wait a minute, okay. I haven't really paid that much attention to that, and so I need to deal with that. You see, we find, and I'm going to read in Revelation 21 and 22 in closing, but we find in Revelation 9 and Revelation 16 that these things had to be repented of, sorcery and witchcraft. These things and idolatry, they had to be repented of. And it's said that when God was pouring His judgment... Uh, or when He pours His judgment, that there are those that would not repent. They would not repent of these things, of sorcery and idolatry and witchcraft and the things uh, that they, the works of their hands.
But notice in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20, a priest on idolatry last Sunday night. Um, we're talking about witchcraft right now in the occult. Notice the two spiritual sins that the Apostle Paul says that are a work of the flesh. And that's going to be in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20. In verse 19, they're called the works of the flesh. He, he, he talks about sexual sins, social sins, spiritual sins. But notice he says in verse 20 and 21, idolatry and notice witchcraft. And we find that in verse 21, the latter part of this, and it says, And they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not those that are doing something and don't understand it. It's those that are habitually involved in this. You see. Well, turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. I'll tell you, we'll just close in Revelation chapter 21. 1 verse 7 and 8, and you can write down Revelation chapter 22 in verses 14 and 15. And this is where all of this will end up. It will end up in the lake of fire. In the lake of fire. Uh, Notice as we come here to Revelation chapter 21. We find here, I'm reading in verse 7 and 8, it takes the saved and the lost and compares them. And you'll notice he says in verse 7, And he that overcometh, remember I mentioned that this morning, we are overcomers in Christ. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. But, notice in verse 8, here's the lost. He said, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, and what? The sorcerers. The sorcerers. He says, and the idolaters. See, that's the two subjects we've spent some time on. He says that they shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's why it has to be repented of. Now, I'm not going to... I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But let me make mention of this. When you talk about the... Let's talk about the Olympics, first of all. I want you to read this article if if you're not familiar with it and listen to the sermon. The Olympics are pagan festivals. This is the way they started out. And, of course, they ceased for a number of years. You know why they ceased? Because of Christianity. Christianity grew so much that, that uh, the Olympics ceased for a number of years. And uh, it's very popular, millions uh, involved, uh, involved in it. And I put on the front of this, according to the world, the Olympics is the most important athletic event involving many different sports uh, with competitors from nearly every nation on earth since 1896. This is when they were started back. And, uh, and I'll put in here the origin of uh, the Olympic Games, the paganism of the Olympic Games, and the worldliness of the Olympic Games. And again, we got this in audio. It's on, it's on our website. And it's on Servant Audio. And then we got it here in print as well. And there's, by the way, anytime you pick up an article, unless it's a transcript or a booklet, that's word for word. These articles are not word for word. They'll be more in the sermon than they will be in the article. So just keep that in mind. But uh, I give a history of when that the Olympics, uh, when, when it's believed that they uh, started, and uh, by the Greeks, these sporting events from about 776 B.C. to about A.D. 3. 94, the first recorded Olympics game took place in Olympia, Greece in 776 B.C. Some believe it's actually earlier. Uh, I kind of got in between some of the dates with, with people when I wrote this. And I actually wrote this 12 years ago. I wrote it in 2010 and preached the sermon. And uh, so the recorded Olympic Games lasted about 1170 years. And uh, I put in here... I deal with the Greek civilization that gave the world the institution of athletics and organized sports. Uh, 
as an art form on par with the arts of architect and sculpture and portrait and theater and so forth. Alexander the Great in the 4th century promoted the uh, sports among the people. A, a, a sports hero in Greece, was sounds like America today, was as a religious figure and would be elevated with praise. He would be worshipped. He would receive money and benefits and fame and say, things of that nature. I can't read it all. But the paganism, what I deal with when I talk about the paganism, I go back and deal with the ceremonies back in the original games and, um, and, and how the winners even gave sacrifice at the temple of Zeus. And I go back and deal with that. Then I bring it up to 1996 in America and, uh, and I give, uh, what, what was done in this country and how pagan that modern day Olympics games are. And I went through the opening ceremonies of 1996 at Atlanta, Georgia. In other words, they gave homage to Zeus. You say, no, they didn't. Go look it up. I saw the videos of it. I found the videos when I was writing this article. And I put in here what they did and concerning the Temple of Zeus and, and things of that nature. And then the third point in this, I dealt with the worldliness of the Olympics. And so it's worth going back and reading, not because I wrote it, but most of it is just quoting those who are involved in it. Yoga is the same thing. Do you know that ten years ago when I wrote this article, and no, this not ten years, I did this in 2017, that'd be five years ago, when I wrote this article and preached this, they were... Uh, they were uh, 10% of Americans at that time, you know it's more now, were involved in yoga. That's about 30 million people in, a, in America involved in yoga. And, and the thing about it is, is that yoga means union or to yoke, and it refers to the union of oneself with the divine, the human spirit with the universe. And the design is to yoke or bind your inner divinity with universal divinity, that is the object with the subject, the worshiper with God, Brahma, not God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It means to yoke or bind with the gods of Hinduism and his practice in the Hindu religion. So we have a sermon and article on this five years ago, 2017. And I deal with the fact that yoga is a false religion, it, it is a false religion rooted an Eastern religion and mysticism, and, and I quote from some of their authors, the yogis, and so forth. I quote from some of their, arg, their, their authors. Uh, the yoga philosophy cannot be separated from yoga practices. Some people believe it can. For it is connected to Eastern religion, and yoga meditation is the emptying of the mind but in Christianity, in the Bible, meditation is filling your mind with the Word of God so that you can meditate on God. And there's also the modesty issue when you start talking about the yoga pants and everything else. Uh, I Back in uh, 10 years ago, um, yeah, 10 years ago, 2012, dealt with superheroes. And uh, I'm just going to go to the middle of this. I, I dealt with the money that's made off of all of these and the movies and the magazines and the comic books and so forth. Uh, they've been around uh, for over 90 years. It's nothing new. And uh, the gospel of superheroes is a false gospel. Captain Marvel, I'm just going to give a brief thing of him I put in this article. He met Wizard Shazam. Now, you, you think about how can I learn about Christ from this. He met, he met Wizard Shazam as a boy and was given powers of Greek gods and heroes, which is mythology. Storm is a descendant of an ancient African priestess who is worshipped as a goddess and has powers over the weather. Superman came from the fictional planet Krypton. He is an alien living on earth. He is a secular, you hear me? He is a secular savior from the heavens, trying to imitate the Bible. 
And we find Spider-Man has special powers. He has spider senses alerting him to danger. He has perfect... Um, let me back up. He has perfect balance with superhuman speed. His human DNA is mutated. This is wicked. Batman is the height of human perfection who spent his life, now listen, spent his life avenging the death of his parents. What are we told in Scripture? Vengeance is mine, saith God. And it goes on to say, he obtained great physical and intellectual strength. Wonder Woman and Amazon based on a race of women in Greek mythology. The Amazons had special human qualities. She had super speed, strength, and is skilled in combat. And she has indestructible bracelets to deflect bullets and communicate with animals. Where is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the divinity and deity of Jesus Christ with the superheroes? Superheroes are to give you something to substitute for the Lord Jesus Christ so that you don't need Him. And, uh, and also, uh, let me see here, video games. Video games today, they are filled with graphic scenes, evils, killings, aggressions, nudity, crime, witchcraft, blood, gore, thefts. Um, exploitations of women, hatred, disrespect for authority. This is, I did this sermon and article in 2012. That's been 10 years. And then my third point, there's three points in the booklet, and this is word for word. I did this December uh, 2015 uh, on martial arts. Uh, there's three points in this. and But the third point is martial arts are rooted in false religions, and I, I, I have, I have over a hundred or read over a hundred quotes by grandmasters or eternal grandmasters. Talk with a lot of people, even Chuck Norris, uh, who claims to be a Christian and is involved in this, and he does, he has done movies and won many world champions. He's probably not able to do these things now. I can't remember his age. But I looked him up, and you know when I did this, and uh, but here's what he said. He said that the ancient system of Zen is the core. That's Zen Hinduism is the core philosophy behind martial arts. That's what he says about it. In other words, he does it, but he admits that the ancient system of Zen is the core philosophy behind martial. Arts. And one last thing, and we'll be through. We find that when we look at the children of Israel, and I'm taking this from the article written in 2006 on, on the subject of sports, we, we think about the children of Israel. And, um, and let me just read from this instead of trying to tell you. Um, let me find in the in the Hebrew history we're we're talking again about Old Testament coming into the New Testament. In Hebrew history, athletes as we know it today cannot be found. These were foreign to the Jewish culture until influenced by the Greeks and Romans. Now listen, in scripture we do not find gymnasiums or competitive sports it was not until after the conquests, and this ties in with my article on the Olympics as well. But let me back up here. Um, in the Scriptures, we do not find gymnasium or competitive sports. It was not until after the conquest of Palestine by Alexander the Great then, that a sporting games were introduced among the Israelites. Even though Alexander the Great died at 33, his legacy is seen in the Middle East as well as other places uh, in the architects of public buildings, gymnasiums for games, and open-air theaters. It was the Greeks that built a gymnasium at Jerusalem for the use of competitive sports, and the Romans continued those events when they rose to power. The Romans became obsessed with amusements, Erecting their coliseums, their circuses, and the circuses, by the way, was horse races, you know. 
and theaters for the pleasures of their citizens, the gladiators' shows were highly attended among the Romans. In these events, the people took great pleasure in brutalizing, in the brutalizing of others when they were thrown to the wild beast in the amphitheater. And I want to add one more thing. The early church writers, not only the Bible, not only the Bible, we don't find in the Bible the Hebrews building gymnasiums. Alexander built the first in Jerusalem. So we go to the Scriptures, but let me say this, the early church writers, that is from the 2nd and 3rd century, those that wrote, doesn't mean they're infallible, but the very fact that they address these things. The early church writers did not speak against bodily exercise. We all need that. But they did speak of the vain glory of competitive sports and public games. We have to look at the roots of things and make our decisions how we are to live our lives. Will you stand with me, please? Father, we thank Thee this evening for Thy love and Thy mercy and Thy kindness. We thank You for Your Word, Your indwelling Holy Spirit. Lord, help us all to walk in Thy ways as we said this morning. Lord, is there not a cause? And we know that there is. And Lord, we thank Thee for that cause that You've given to us to live for Thee. And we know that our pilgrim life here as pilgrims and strangers is short. But Lord, help us to live for eternity. That doesn't mean we cannot enjoy this life, but Lord, help us to stay steady with the things that You've called us to do. Help us to fight that good fight of faith. And Lord, help us to love You and serve You, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.